Hi, uh, my name is Albert Yumal, but you can call me Bash. For the next 30 minutes or so, I will talk about my experience as a data activist in the Philippines where I use my skills to help the marginalized and oppressed sectors of our communities. I will highlight how Python and open source technology are at the core of our solutions and maybe give you some directions on how you can do it as well. Here are the main objectives of this session. We will describe the current orientation of technology and its activism. We will talk about how technology is a central tool for the transformation of societies. We will discuss the role of Python in impact use cases and common libraries and packages we use in live projects and even in production. And of course, through to my activism, I hope to encourage and inspire you to also use your skills to make the world a better place for all with the skill sets that we have in data and technology. Quick introduction uh, about me. I am a data activist based in the Philippines. I advocate for technology for the people, of the people, and by the people. Um, recall that even in science and in technology, there is a myth of objectivity. Uh, for you who have some background in machine learning, even the models that we create have biases. And it is ultimately up to us where we put our biases. And for me, as an activist, uh, I use it to help serve the marginalized and the oppressed. Originally, my background is instrumentation physics but now I transitioned as a full stack data scientist where I work with machine learning models and apply it to solve real world problems. I am currently in the finance industry where I am part of a team that monitors risks, fraud, and money laundering in our financial markets. If you want to connect with me and even collaborate, please do reach me through LinkedIn at Albert Humol through my blog, albertumol.github.com, where I also put content about my projects, and of course on GitHub, where I put all of my open source code. Um, the code for the projects discussed in this session is also on my GitHub, so feel free to fork and apply it to your own use cases. Again, sharing is caring in our communities. All right, so remember, for you who don't know what activism is, activism is a way of life. It's, it is not necessarily a lifestyle. It is not necessarily grand. It can be as small as, for example, uh, advocating for using less plastics. But for the context of our session today, uh, we will define activism as social activism, meaning how our activism can affect and change the lives of others for the better. Um, activism can be a purpose and the advocacy that you stand for. Ideally, it should be in harmony in your current work and that you work for organizations that your values are also aligned and shared. And in doing activism, you should remember that you should not do it alone. There is power in numbers after all. You do it with a community of like-minded advocates similar to how we construct and structure our tech communities. From my observations on the current trends of communities, more and more of us advocate not only for tech adoptions but also fighting for issues that affect every one of us like representation, gender, and fighting against racial discrimination. One example is from MongoDB. They put in their website their calls against um, black community discrimination in the States. Um, so that's really commendable. Um, we can see through these practices that um, everything is connected to everything, right? Um, everything is political in, in a sense because the things that we build uh, affects the lives of people. When you live uh, life as a tech activist, 
uh, every time you wake up in the morning, you should ask yourself, for whom do I do the things that I do and for what purpose? Maybe you can try this exercise as well as a mindfulness practice before you go to your code routines or code stations to be more motivated. Um, I do this practice very often to just energize myself and not really treat my task as job but as a hobby. So I know that by doing this code, I'm like helping and transforming um, something that is more than my own. Alright, so I hope I was able to explain the type of activism that we will discuss for this session. Uh, now let's formally begin. Technology, as you already know, uh, in some level or another, has progressed so much in the past decade. We are able to find the cure for diseases and even for COVID in just a matter of months. We're able to go to the surface of Mars with our intelligent robots and even pack our phones with high-performing computing capacities. Who could have imagined that the science fiction's concepts we read as a child is now materializing? Facebook or slash Meta already started its transformation to augmented and virtual realities. Let's just do hope and hold them accountable to make it ethical though. It is sad that although we have these technological advancements in place, we have yet to solve more pressing problems like poverty, hunger, and systemic inequality. The current orientation of technology right now, in its majority, is for big businesses and corporations for profit. But technology has also immense potential for solving very socially relevant problems. We should remember our core on how we define technology and how historically it played a role in the evolution of our societies. So technology uh, might be defined as many other things like the types and patterns of our activities, the equipments, the tools, and the materials that we use, the knowledge that we store in our storage devices um, so we can perform our tasks more efficiently. So what we will do for the next few slides is to really glimpse through history on how technology evolved and how it shaped our societies. So this might seem like a flashback of your history lessons in elementary, high school, or even college, but it is very interesting um, to really navigate about the role of technology in these types of societies that we have evolved in. So during the primitive communal, when we were hunters and gatherers, we define technology as our stone tools, our bows and arrows, our husbandry and tillage, how we produce the animals. And those are the main tools that we have uh, in terms of storing those technology. If I remember my history correctly, we use uh, to write and draw in stone caves as our medium to store those information. Um, during the slave society, on the other hand, uh, I think the tools that we were using back then were the bronze weapons, the iron blacksmiths, and the tools in agriculture that we use. In terms of communication, I think this is the time when we invented the abacus, our first computer counting device, uh, the papyrus as well as a means of communicating and transmitting information. And I think this is where the Egyptians also created their number systems to count for the exchange in products and the produce that they, they had for their seasons. Uh, moving forward to the feudal society, I think the tools that we used back then are the wheels, the water mills, the horses, and the draft animals for transportation. Uh, one defining feature in feudal society is the art of war. We invented the gunpowder, the long bow, and, and cannons. And I think through this kind of characteristic, we are able to see that technology has been used as a dialectic tool. Uh, what do we mean when we say dialectic? We mean that it can be used as a tool for good, but it can also be used as a tool for bad. These types of scenarios back then is 
also reflected to how we use technology right now, right? For example, in, in social media, we use it to communicate to our loved ones and friends, but it can also be a tool for people to propagate fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. So a lot of the things we see and observe are not really new, but the mediums uh, really change a lot, and that is what interests us. Uh, another like characteristic uh, development in the feudal society uh, is the printing press. Uh, it also emerged in the feudal societies allowing the first explosion of information because then they were able to produce books and newspapers so they can like uh, like propagate things that they believe in. I think the church used it to like create Bibles and their doctrines. Uh, moving to our current system in a capitalist society, uh, I think before the defining characteristic of uh, capitalist societies, the steam engine, the spinning jenny, uh, the gasoline-powered tractor. Uh, this period also marked the world wars and the invention of uh, the atomic bomb. So, like, I'm not sure how, like, the scientists back then, like Einstein's and his teammates, were reviewing how they created the atomic bomb. Uh, I think in their mindset, um, they were creating the atomic bomb as a source of um, huge amount of energies, but uh, it was used as a weapon of mass destruction. So bringing back to the concept that technology is indeed a dialectical tool. Um, one striking characteristic of um, our capitalist society right now is the use of telephones, computers, and the World Wide Web. And transitioning, to the current uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution that we are currently in, the main tool in our arsenal is data and of course algorithms. So these are the softwares that we build as machines to automate and augment our work. And this is the main motivation of how we build our solutions, the technology that available that is available for us. But as I've mentioned, since technology is a dialectic tool, other people might use this for business, for whatever computation or propaganda that they're using it with. But for this discussion, we'll focus on how we can use technology as a tool for social transformation. From all of the things that I've mentioned, we went back to some of our history lessons uh, and the technology as a dialectic tool. What we can say is that technology has really played a vital role in the evolution of societies. It's at the center. Um, and for us working in the tech industry, we should recognize our role uh, as vital movers and transformers of our societies. Um, so although that technology is vital, uh, it could have been used to end poverty, hunger, and other social ills of the world, but it is not mainly used for that purpose yet. So if we look at the net worth of the richest people in the world, all of them work in tech. So literally, tech is transforming our world. And again, as data workers ourselves, we need to recognize our roles to use and create technology as extensions of our humanities. Are we creating technology that only benefits and rewards the few? Or are we bringing back technology to the people? Now, this begs us the question, why are the most basic needs of the poor and marginalized not being addressed despite the unprecedented level of technological advancements today? Why are so many people still can't afford basic health services, universal health, education, why it's still too expensive? So maybe in the future, we can transform this question, not only a why, but into like what are the needs and how do we solve these problems? All right. So it now lies in the hands of the people to spark this change and truly make technology serve the people. So that's the inspiration for this project. Now, let's look at some sample projects that materializes what I've been saying and how uh, this type of activism works in tech. One project um, 
that I did together uh, with the community of AI enthusiasts in the Philippines is to understand the energy landscape of the country. A uh, few months ago, we were experiencing a lot of power outages as we are heavily reliant on fossil fuel here in the Philippines. We wanted to understand our options so we can rally to the people in the government to take action. We created the model to predict the best sites in the country where to put solar panels using satellite data and spatiotemporal analysis. So ultimately, we were able to characterize the energy crisis and engage more conversations and call to actions. We organized a community to work for a month to do this project, to find the data, and to learn from the process while contributing to the problem. Uh, we call this process citizen science. We let the community to self-organize themselves, inspire each other, and use collective wisdom to solve the problems. Uh, I personally learned a lot from the experience. I learned so much about geospatial processing and even the electronics behind a solar panel because we used it to calculate the power output if we are like building some um, supervised machine learning models. So here are some of the tools uh, in Python that we used. You can screenshot some of them. Uh, you can also contact me later on after the talk if you have questions or you need some guidance if you want to replicate uh, the use case that, that we are mentioning. Uh, GeoPandas, we use it for geospatial processing. Matplotlib, Seaborn, Bokeh, and Plotly for our static and dynamic visualizations. Scikit-Image and OpenCV for image processing, Pandas, NumPy, and Spicy for our, um, SciPy, I mean, for our numerical calculations, and Scikit-Learn and Profit for our uh, time series and machine learning segments. Alright, so I hope you're able to screenshot it. Uh, again, do contact me if you have some questions regarding these tools. Uh, another interesting project uh, that emerged during the pandemic is Matpot, the Chatpot. Uh, a lot of Filipino students and teachers struggled learning online the past few months. So I guided some of my students to create a gamified chatbot that answers math trivia and questions uh, and even have some exercises and games inside the platform. So these types of chatbots uh, can be deployed using progressive web applications or PWAs. So PWAs are deployments that work even without internet bandwidth. You just need mobile signal. Uh, this is very relevant to the Philippines because um, our internet is really, really, really slow and a lot of our provinces are low penetration areas, meaning um, people don't really have access to internet. Which is a sad thing because UN declared in 2016 that internet is already a basic human right uh, but still in the Philippines, uh, it's still a privilege to have access to internet. For the tools for, the, for that project, uh, we use NLTK and Spacey for uh, the natural language processing segment. Uh, we used Clarify for the image identification for the chatbot to recognize like basic shapes. For example, a square, it can give you the area and the perimeter of the square. And the bot father uh, Telegram API to initially deploy the chatbot in uh, the Telegram uh, platform. So again, screenshot uh, the tools if you are interested to replicate uh, the use case for the chatbot. Um, another use case for us uh, on how we use Python as a tool to uh, tell stories and fight disinformation campaigns. Uh, last year, the government, um, the Philippine government made the pronouncement that the reason why there were so many COVID cases in the country is because people are not following safety protocols. But the data says otherwise. We look at Google Mobility data and saw that the foot traffic and movement are mostly in residential areas, meaning people are really staying at home and should not be blamed for the lack of concrete plans and vaccination efforts by the government. So we do use data to call out these pronouncements that are not backed up by data but uh, are also not evidence-based. So recently, 
uh, another project that we built, um, a lot of the mainstream media in, in the country are reporting about the blatant and rampant corruption in the country from the mismanagement of the pandemic funds to ghost hospitals receiving money. In a situation where majority of our people are getting hungry and losing options, we can't really afford to have our meager resources squandered by corrupt government officials and entities. So one recent project that I did is to use Python to understand corruption in the procurement system in the Philippines. Uh, and that is the motivation of this project. How can we show through data the anomalous transactions of government agencies so that we may be able to flag auditing bodies and hold into account those who are stealing from the public treasury. Um, I used a network analysis. If you're familiar with uh, network theory and graph theory to quantify uh, corrupt practices like bid rigging. So the big circle here uh, in this plot that you are seeing represent a hospital in the Philippines. The small circles are the companies that bid for a particular product or service. The lines connecting these circles uh, or the edges we call them in network theory are the prices of the transactions or the bids. And as you can see, the big blue circle has the highest number of uh, nodes connected to it, meaning it has the highest degree or it might be like the focus of, of, of the graph. A uh, bid rigging happens when group of firms conspire to raise prices or lower the quality of goods, works, or services offered in public tenders. Um, bid rigging always aims to eliminate competition, resulting in high prices. Thus, the government pays more or loses in quality. And mapping and understanding the operation of the market can help us avoid collusion arrangements or bid rigging conspiracies between competitors. Um, another ind indicator of a corrupt practice in, in government uh, procurement process uh, is low competition. If you get the median number of bidders per product, for example, even compare it to other countries, um, or there is a single company that is the sole bidder, that might be a point of concern and a good area for investigation. Uh, more connections and average line thickness across the connections are generally an indicator of health. Uh, in your procurement system because there is more competition and the prices are more or less uniformly distributed. There are many other metrics that I use for this project, but feel free to message me to know more about the algorithms. Uh, the main library that I use for this project is called NetworkX. Uh, it is a package that allows for the creation, manipulation, and study of the structure, dynamics, and functions of complex networks. Uh, it contains uh, most of the standard algorithms and has a very strong community of developers that support it. Uh, you can also use Network X to explore graph configurations and more advanced network statistics and metrics uh, that were also relevant to al the algorithms that I defined earlier on. And one way for you to know this, of course, is by reading the documentation. Okay, uh, another project um, that I did um, around two years ago is related to education again. Uh, I joined a hackathon with my friends and applied simple machine learning models to explain why there is a high dropout rate in the schools in the southern Philippines region. Using explainable correlations and just very basic statistics, we saw that one of the reasons why students drop out um, in schools are birth certificates. We saw, and after analyzing the, the, the systems of how schools accept students, schools have stricter requirements as you go along higher grades, and those communities affected don't really have access to IDs such as birth certificates. Um, again, in, in the Southern Philippines, we have lots of uh, indigenous communities, so um, the municipalities, uh, and centers are really far from their houses, so it's really hard to access those uh, IDs. So after the hackathon, after us providing our insights, we saw some efforts to have caravans to give uh, these communities free birth certificates, and indeed, it translated to more students uh, attending the classes. So for my last uh, project demo, uh, I looked into how uh, to better organize people so they can join rallies and mobilizations. Uh, from my current observations, I saw that Gen Zs and millennials are 
socially woke, but sometimes it just happens in the Twitterverse or online. The problems that we are solving are real and physical problems, so we really need warm bodies on the streets to shout and assert for our advocacies. I use uh, big data and hidden Markov chains to uh, predict when will big rallies happen in the country and what is the most probable issue that uh, people will clamor for on this particular use case. I uh, used news data from GDELT where they store all the news around the globe every 15 minutes. You can use BigQuery to access this particular treasure trove. Uh, a lot of um, use cases in natural language processing by big corpus are using uh, this technology. So might as well, let's use this to like understand social dynamics and help solve people's issues. Um, ultimately, I was able to do some uh, sensible predictions and now this tool that I created, this algorithm that I created now aids me on how I plan uh, and involve more people uh, in my activism moving forward. Alright, and that is all for my session um, on how I use Python as a tool for social activism. I hope you gain some interest in using skills and potentials to serve a greater purpose and to help other people live lives with dignity. So thank you so much. Uh, if you have questions, we have a Q&A and you can also reach me through uh, this following channels. Again, you can connect with me through LinkedIn. Uh, just search my name, Albert Humaland. Uh, feel free to message me there through my GitHub account. Uh, the projects that I mentioned, you can see the code. Uh, most of them are there. And you can also read some of the things that I write in my blog. Again, thank you so much for listening. Um, please course your questions in our Q&A. Thank you so much. The, the Friday yesterday's uh, panel discussion was uh, very enlightening. Um, yeah. from, from Bash, so we had also uh, people coming from uh, MY, from uh, ID, uh, from various perspectives. So, Dash was talking more on activism. Why we have uh, Dr. Lau, who was uh, who is who is teaching, right? So that's how he uses it in academics. Um, and then uh, Diwa, who uh, uh, went through his experience um, as a student and how he got into using machine language to well help the. Indonesian government, for example. So that was very enlightening. Uh, but for today, uh, Q&A, we are going to go deeper into Bash work uh, based on uh, his talk on using Python as a tool for social activism. So uh, if we have any questions from spectators, uh, we have Ivy and also Jean. Uh, you can mm -hmm. always write in the live chat or ask in the Q&A. Ah, Hi, Neil. Coming. So I'm uh, dropping the, the link to um, Albert talk over here in the live chat. You can go check uh, it out. If you haven't uh, watched it yet. OK, so um, let me start. I have, I have a, like a question uh, after watching Bash's um, uh, talk, right? Um, mm -hmm. I was pretty interested in the project that uh, you, you use all this variety of tools to um, pre predict the energy usage um, and then decide, help decide where to put the solar panels, right? Um, can, can you go a little bit deeper on on that project itself, it was, it, was, it was really interesting to me. Yeah, actually, I had another conference yesterday. It's called Festival of Maps. So it's a celebration that we do in the Philippines to celebrate open source technology in our mapping community. So I also presented the, a more detailed uh, description of the project. There. I can give you the, the link of the project here so you can explore the web application that we built, even the code, because it's open source. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. interesting because we only had a month to the project. And I invited 100 engineers around the world to help solve it. So the concept really citizen science and how we invite 100 people to use their skills to, to 
contribute to impact projects. Give me one sec. I'll just share with you the um, web application that we built um, so you can explore it as well. But the basic idea is we use satellite images to mm -hmm. uh, apply image processing and computer vision. I'm not sure how to place the messages. Uh, it's in the live chat. So, in the live chat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the live chat. Uh, there's a link there so you can visit the application. Uh, but basically, uh, what we did, uh, we did some um, processing of government data from the Department of Energy. Uh, we got satellite images and we had one assumption. Our assumption is that if there is a huge amount of population in the area but there are no light at night, they could be a demand there to put solar panels because there are a lot of people but they don't have enough electricity to light their homes. Um, so that's one of our like important assumptions that I think were also based from uh, published uh, journals and articles relevant to poverty analytics and energy consumption. Um, I think there are also similar projects that was built and inspired uh, by our project that was applied in Nigeria. Uh, some of our colleagues also contacted us, so they were able to skip from the project that we built. And I think that's the beauty of the liberty in the open. Uh, I think people can really exercise uh, building from the ideas of others through collaborative um, mm -hmm. methods. Yes, yes, and that's the the next thing which occurred to me and and on that point also is uh it's it's a huge thing it's huge i mean i i if you told me like with the just with the circle of people that i know okay let's let's do this within one month this is something which i don't even know where to start so <laughs> how do you rally all these people I mean, we have the tools so you already pointed to the tools that we use but how do you rally all these people to come together and do it in a very short period of time for this particular cause. Right. Can you um, talk more about that? Yeah. I am a believer of, well, my background in research is really complex systems and complex systems apply to human behavior. So interestingly, a lot of physics equations can help us understand that. And I think one particular concept that we can borrow is called uh, emergence and self-organization. So complex systems like human behavior, similar to animals, for example, if you see a flock of birds and they form like a V-shape to navigate in an optimum manner towards like the sky to, to a particular direction, I think humans work the same way. But there are hurdles in, in organizing huge amount of people. Um, in, in crowd dynamics, there is a concept called diffusion of responsibility or the bystander effect. If the tasks are not clear to people, if they are not enough motivation and inspiration to start the task, they will not do anything. So it's really important to understand the, the persona of the collaborators in the project. So that was, that's what I did. I, I did some feasibility study of who will uh, partake in the project, how we can optimize, maximize their contribution and their learning experience. So I treat this as a dialectic process. The contributors will not only contribute their skills, but they would also learn a lot from the process, the technical skill set, the um, the soft skills as well, how they communicate the projects and, and how they can like build an end-to-end -end project at a very short amount of style. We borrowed a lot of concepts from uh, Agile methodology, like how we do the Agile ways of working in tech. So we, we borrowed a lot of those methodologies and even align on the best tools that we can find in the internet to make our work efficient because we, we had the tight deadline. We have a similar project working on right now. As I mentioned yesterday, I'm working on understanding computational propaganda and how we can optimize helping uh, people uh, vote for their candidates who are aligned with their advocacy and their core beliefs and values. So we're also doing the same, but we extended it into two months because uh, the Philippine data is really dirty in terms of election. There's a lot of noise and misinformation coming from Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So we had to understand it first. So we, we had like a more leeway time to do the project. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, just hearing you talk about it sounds so exciting. <laughs> um, uh, we have Nell. Nell, are you with us? Uh, uh, you are also from the Philippines. Um, do you have anything that you want to add, or uh, you know, any questions for for Bash? Hello, hello. Good morning, hello, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. Bash. How are you doing, sir? Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, with the data that you gathered, right, for for social activism, especially in the lands in the Philippine landscape. 
we know that we are really far behind when it comes to data gathering in way. our country. <laughs> yes, how how confident are we that we will be able to bring a much Back. better picture on on what people can really, especially the elections are coming in what in the next six months, right? By May, we will be having our presidential election by May. How much clarity do you think we can be when it comes to the data that or, or the information that we can present to the people of the Philippines? Yeah, uh, that, that's a very interesting question. Actually, I'm not doing this alone. I'm also consulting with a lot of political experts in the Philippines because that's what we do in the data industry, right? We're only people who have the tools, but we don't necessarily have the domain expertise and understanding of it. So uh, I am in connivance with, with Rappler, with Maria Reza, actually. We were part of like uh, like doing this. If you know Maria Reza, she just recently won a Nobel Prize uh, regarding her study on disinformation and misinformation in the Philippines. So I am in connivance with my policy professors in college to verify uh, the things that we're seeing in the data. And I think um, you're, you're very correct in the point that are there any value though that we can get given the dirty of the dataness of the data? But I think there are some lessons to be learned because uh, based on the, the clustering algorithms that we're building, we were able to classify the noise and how we can sift out the noise and get the, the exact sentiments of the people and quantifying that noise, the trolls, the, the, the people uh, uh, used to clutter like and, and dirty the data in the internet is also an input for us because now we can understand the dynamics of how people um, propagate their propagandas in, in the internet. So that's also an interesting dynamic. But uh, I do agree we need more people to be onboarded in, in QAing, in, in, in cleaning the data, in, in sifting through the noise. But I think it's it's a moving target. Uh, it doesn't end in, in two months. It is continuous process that we can like use even after the elections because this can be scaled to other applications as well, which involves human interaction. And I think that's the purpose, to have a generalized tool set that we can use to help each other to analyze and build better solutions to understand societies. Yeah. Bless you with your work, Bash. Hey, Bless you. you with that one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I know that the whole Python community, Python PH community, is, you know, have the full backing, you know, with you and support, yeah, and you know, yeah. on this work. Because I think I think it's about time that we could use those tools that are available for us, especially with, you know, using Python or using data analytics to really be able to present to people a, a really balanced view and that they could use for their you know critical decisions thank you so much i think it's very important right now what what you mentioned because um as i mentioned yesterday technology is a dialectic tool like other people are using it for for this information but the same technology can also be used to fight misinformation. Like the tools that Cambridge Analytica was using to profile uh, Facebook users are the same tools that I use to understand misinformation and even the corruption project that I did and presented way back in Python uh, Taiwan, uh, Python Taiwan. So uh, it's very interesting that that we as technologists have this role really to um, QA and and safeguard the tools that that are being used for uh, whatever purposes. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Bash. And as always, uh, talking to you make time goes really fast. So <laughs> we don't have uh, much more. I think we have around two minutes left for the Q and A. Right. Uh, any any other people in our audience? So uh, we have Ben. Uh, hi there, Ben. Do you have any questions for Bash? No, sorry. I, I came in sort of towards the end of that, so I was just absorbing. Sorry. It was very good. <laughs> By the way, Doc ben, Dr. Ben uh, yeah. will be the next uh, right, uh, resource speaker for the uh, next session about community and health also, which he will be taking or talking about or answering questions that is really bugging a lot of us, time of, especially with the pandemic, posture and pain. And I would like you to ask if you'd like to stay after this and we could ask more questions to Dr. Ben later on. Okay, so Dr. Ben will be our next Q&A. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, Bash, uh, any parting words to our 
audience right now, live, or anyone who will be watching the video later on. Um, I think the work, as, as Nell mentioned, the work that you're doing, especially for uh, the, the Philippines, the Philippines, Philippines is very important. And more generally, since the work that you're doing is being shared with other activists all around the world for the betterment of their own societies, anything that you would like to uh, give as a, as a uh, party message before we end the Q&A session? Okay, um, thank you so much for giving the opportunity to share the activism that we do in the country. I don't do this alone. I do this with uh, with the backing of a huge community, not only in the Philippines, but it's really a movement. We can see this pattern all around the world that people in tech are moving towards uh, contributing their skill set to social good and social uh, impact. I think uh, we have many talents, um, mostly here in, in, in the Asia-Pacific region, and we just need more warm bodies in the social impact space. Again, there is power in numbers. Uh, the future is really working in the open. The future is really collaborative innovation. So I hope we can encourage more people to join our space and we can continue to hold the line and bring more people to uh, live lives with dignity using tech. So I'm really excited. Thank you so much.